Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Hey there, welcome to episode 57 of the Flavors Unknown podcast. Today, we are celebrating Filipino cuisine with Chef Carlo La Magna from Portland, Oregon. We will understand why Filipino cuisine hasn't been part of the American landscape for a decade and why it took so long to see Filipino cuisine celebrated. Chef Carlo La Magna describes the different influences on Filipino food through history. He shares his top Filipino dishes and talks to us about his modern take on Filipino cuisine. I am your host, Emmanuel Laroche. I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US. And every other week, I interview trending chef, pastry chef, and bartenders from around the country. If you are new to the podcast, my guest last week was Chef Lamar Moore from Las Vegas. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe to the show and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown. You can find the show notes from this episode on the website flavorsunknown.com. And now here is my conversation with Chef Carlo La Magna. Hi, Chef. Uh, how are you? I'm good, Manuel. How are you, sir? I am very good. Thank you. And uh, welcome to Flavors Unknown. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. I do, I've listened to quite a bit of the show and it's, uh, it's an honor to be on there. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we uh, quickly, um, I would say, met uh, several years back at the Star Chefs um, event in, in Portland. So I have um, a good, um, you know, uh, memory of, you know, the, the tasting that, uh, that we had. So that That's was, right. that was I cool. remember. I remember, yeah. <laughs> it was it was a busy time, but there there were a lot of people. But yes, you know, yeah, the, it was a busy French time. In, uh, <laughs> <stands> <laughs> the French accent, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which, which accent? Come on. So, oh. <laughs> the, <laughs> so the uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, since then you have now your you know your your own restaurants, and a big part of our discussion today is going to be around uh, Filipino food and. Uh, yeah, I want to start with, uh, I'm really excited to talk about this because that's a big trend, you know, on the U.S. market uh, in the past, I would say, past few years. It's really striking me that when, um, you know, a lot of people ask for suggestion when it comes to, you know, to restaurants, you hear a lot of people talking about Thai food, about ramen, about Korean barbecue, pho, you know, sushi, obviously, and, you know, Indians for sure. But very rarely we hear about like, hey, here's my recommendation for a Filipino, you know, uh, restaurants and why? What do you think that uh, it, it is the case? To really answer the question and to understand that the reasoning behind it, you have to look at kind of the past a little bit. Not a lot of people realize this, but the Filipino, you know, the Filipino community are actually one of the oldest immigrants here in the U.S., brought over via, you know, via trade ships and trade galleons during, I believe, the Spanish era. Spain obviously colonized the Philippines for 300 years and has made its way, you know, we, we've made our way over through that route. I think that you'll see that a lot of the reasoning that Filipino food has not made its way into the mainstream is that, you know, the Filipino community itself was kind of forced to assimilate into any culture that they go into, they often found themselves kind of maybe holding back on the heritage or holding back on the on the culture and food that they're used to because they they kind of wanted to be indiscri you know indiscriminate. They wanted to be kind of in the shadows, if you will, not causing a stir. That phrase of, of being like, oh, we don't want to be a bother is actually applies to the you know the Filipino the Filipino community. Growing up, oftentimes you'll see immigrant parents uh, not wanting their children to speak Tagalog or, or any, any of the native languages that they might have spoke because they wanted them to fit in. I think the reasoning for the food, the reason why, why you don't hear it in the mainstream, even though we are one of the largest 
you know, Asian population, I think we're the what, first or sec- second, second largest Asian population in the United States is because of exactly that. They, they assimilated. So they, they wanted to hide. They didn't, they, they felt like that the food wasn't, that it was just their own. They didn't really want to share it or that the other communities would not care for it. And the historic institutionalized racism here in the U.S. kind of helped, helped suppress that and help pull that down. But as, as the immigrant com- communities continued on, continued coming into the U.S., Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, you're then seeing a much wider acceptance for that type of food. And to the fault of the community itself, at least with Thai, you know, everyone always has an opinion. <laughs> you know, everybody has like, oh, that's not real food. That's not Thai food or that's not Japanese or that's not Korean. The same thing happened with the Filipino community is that they kind of held themselves back and instead of supporting each other, be like, oh, this is great. This person is trying to feed the community. They kind of were like, oh, why would I bother paying X amount of money when I could just make that at home? And that, I think, is actually one of the main reasons why why Filipino food has been held back for so many years with a large community. Yeah. And do you think that's talking about this, like almost like he's not you know, like, um, you know, traditional as well. Do you think that there's a part of the Filipino, maybe like the older part of the Filipino uh, population Absolutely. that was uh, looking at maybe a more the modern version of, uh, you know, of the Filipino restaurant to say like, mm, this is not like the traditional Filipino food. So uh, uh, they, they were not really recognizing it either. Absolutely. I think it's so funny that you say that because, you know, these questions, the, this line of questions will, will kind of, they'll interweave into itself because the older generations that were, again, were, were trying to assimilate into the culture. Now, now you have generations that have come after them that have grown up here that are now wanting to reconnect with their roots. And then you're, now you're seeing, you know, these younger cooks who are like, Oh, this is what's authentic to me, or this is traditional to me. This is what I grew up on. And it could be something completely different because, you know, to, to say that to be quote unquote authentic, that's a loaded word. Unless you're in the Philippines on the native land using native ingredient, I don't think that the word authentic should have any any place in the current vernacular of anybody opening a Filipino restaurant outside of the Philippines, in all honesty. And, you know, I've never been to um, to the Philippines, but looking at the geography of the region, even if you are in the Philippines, because of the way it's structured and it is a, like, uh, you know, a knock archipelagic like country and there's I don't know like seven thousand five hundred like um, you know island. I'm guessing that a recipe in a part of you know those island versus like maybe something that has the same name into another part of of the the region might have completely different spin because it may be used different you know different ingredients or or different sauces or different ingredients in the sauces and so on. So it's probably make like very difficult even to 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 have something like authentic even you know exactly there. yeah i think i think authenticism it depends on the individual i mean like you like you were stating the philippines is is a is by by a country it's it's a small country but it does have 7500 islands depending on the tide <laughs> you know some disappear some show up what a lot of people don't understand that there's so many just take the dialect alone there's so many sub dialects in the Philippines, you know, Tagalog is, is, is just one, even though that's one of the bigger, bigger languages spoken. Like I myself speak too. you know, I, I, I come from the tribe of the Ilocano tribe. There are people that from the South, you know, the, the further South you go, they're the Visayans or, you know, from Davao. But yes, there, there are so many sub dialects. And to understand that is to say that you understand that there are so many sub tribes and sub regions within the Philippines. So their, their ingredient changes. Adobo is a good example is a very popular dish that is well known you know around the world but what people don't realize is that every island and every region in the philippines has its own variations and every family has their own variations so really really to to say that oh this adobo isn't adobo is in a nutshell incorrect because that adobo to me is going to be what is authentic to my to my palate and to my upbringing versus someone who grew up in the south who might add coconut milk or might not add soy sauce, or might not have X, Y, and Z. You know, the, the, again, it's the variations that define what true, what the true, truly authentic is. You know, the Philippines went into like a lot of 
phases through history with a different, um, you know, country that, you know, either invaded it or, you know, took control of it and, uh, you know, and so on. Like, uh, you know, Ma- Malaysian, you had the British, you had the Spanish, you had Chinese, Japanese, and, and so on. So you have all these influences that probably impacted, obviously, the culture and food, because food is part of culture. How would you describe what Filipino cuisine or is because of all those influences? If there is a way that you can you oh, know, yeah. simply you know, describe it to, um, you know, to us? It's, it's funny because this question gets asked quite often, and I've heard many, many answers on it. The most common answer that people give is that it's, it's a fusion cuisine, and I, I couldn't disagree, disagree more. I hate that word, personally. I think fu- when you say fusion, I think P.F. Chang's, you know? By definition, fusion is taking two things that don't belong to each other, with each other, and forcing them to, to stick, basically. I think that Filipino cuisine is an evolutionary cuisine. It evolves, it, just like any other culture, you know, it evolves and withstands the test of time. If you start with the, the indig- indigenous people of the Philippines and you move forward in history, you'll see that those indigenous ing- ingredients and foods and dishes have stayed, have just the only thing that, that has happened is they em- evolved with the introduction of, say, cooking terms or other cooking ingredients or flavor profiles, whether it was soy sauce from the Chinese, from the Chinese immigration and Chinese trade, whether it's, you know, the introduction of farm raised pigs from Spain, you know, traveling on the boats, or whether it's, it's coming from, uh, from Mexico, like some of the indigenous techniques and, and ingredients from Mexico making its way into, into Filipino culture, which a lot of people don't know this is that even though we were colonized by Spain for 300 years, the Spaniards that were that were traveling to the Philippines, you know, via the galleons and all that stuff, think about where the closest outpost of the Spanish Empire was. It was Mexico. So instead of, you know, traveling from mainland Spain, we have a closer connection to to Mexican and Central American culture than we do with Spanish mainland. So you see these things and you see these countries and and coming in, like the US and their influence with the military and the Japanese during World War II. They have taken all of the techniques and maybe some of the names and, and, and the ingredients that were introduced, and they applied it to the indigenous foods of the Philippines and just evolved it to, to kind of go with the times. So at the core of it, it doesn't get lost. It just, maybe the name changed. You know, like adobo, for example, again, going back to that, adobo is, is you know, adobar, means to marinate in Spanish. Now, if you take that and you look at the dish as it, on its own, it was actually an old preservation technique, very similar to that of, um, of making, uh, griettes, like in, mm-hmm. in France, right? So, so you, yeah, cook, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you slow poach the meat in, in its own fat and to preserve it, you know, to create a hermetic seal, you have, you let it cool down in its own fat. And when you need it, you break open the seal and you cook, you cook the meat, correct? So in, in, in the Philippines, the way that we did it was kind of a similar way, except with the addition of, of an acid of vinegar made from, from coconut, uh, from coconut water. That was our preservation technique in order to preserve the meats uh, pre-refrigeration before refrigeration was introduced to us via, via the U.S. That was already a technique that was used in the Philippines from indigenous cultures. And it was just given a name when Spain came along. I mean, 300 years in any country, you're going to see some, some, some change and some influence. That's kind of what history plays its part in the food that we do. I read and as well when I was, you know, tasting when I was in the, in the, the, the restaurant I was mentioning to you, you know, in, um, in, in Seattle. Seattle Masang, yeah. I, if, at, yeah, Masang, it's interesting because there's a lot of, I found like a lot of acidity, a lot of sourness, a lot of sweetness. There's a lot of those contrasts that uh, seems to be relatively important and impactful in Filipino dishes. So, can you talk to us a little bit about this? Because you have you have those elements that you add to the dish uh, that almost after it serves. So I don't know if you call them like flavor adjusters, and somehow they they have those that brightness that comes from you know acidity, sourness, or even sweetness. But and I I'm sorry about uh, you were talking about the French accent, but definitely I don't have the Filipino <laughs> accent. So 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 I don't know if you call it like. Uh, 
you know, bagung or like suka or I don't know if yeah. it's the right term. It's the you right way of very, call, you no, know, you, know you nailed you nailed it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so and you know, I I was interesting as well to see that uh, you know there's uh, in some article I was reading about banana ketchup, you know, for the the sweetness. So. I think this is really fascinating, and I think that it resonates a lot with a like modern way of eating now, which is you know people like to uh, contribute and to play almost with the food, and so this idea of those flavor adjusters, I think, should resonate with like especially like, a younger part of the population here in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. I think what I like to say is that the condiment game in the in the Philippines is very strong. <laughs> you know, I think by tradition. You, when creating a dish in, in any, in any setting, you know, it doesn't matter what country you're from. I think one, you consider cooking with the ingredient that's available to you. And two, the way that I grew up or the way that I look at food is that it's a balance, right? You try to, you try to attack all the senses, all, all the, all the flavor profiles that are on your tongue and create this complex dish. You want to hit all the flavor profiles, right? Sweet, salty, you know, bitter, sour. Oftentimes, you know, I always try to incorporate those elements into each dish that I create or, or that I cook in, in varying degrees, right? Some, some things may call for more acid, but, you know, just to, just to balance that out, you add a touch of sweet and all of a sudden it makes it pop the flavors, you know, things like that. And I think in the, in Filipino cooking, that's exactly what they're doing. You know, it's the same approach as Chinese cooking. You, they're trying to hit all, all of your taste buds. So that on the palate, you just have an explosion of flavor. The thing is, too, they also understand that everybody's palate's different. Some people like something saltier. Some people want more fish sauce or more vinegar or more whatever, whatever it is, more heat, more spice. And so they allow that, you know, they, they create this base dish uh, and then they allow people to adjust it with every bite, you know. And rice, obviously playing a major, uh, key, a key component in any meal. Rice is kind of like that, that background palette. So it's the one that evens everything out, that mutes saltiness or mutes a little bit of the acidity. So then people are forced to, to add a little bit more, you know, because rice is a filler. As a main component in any Filipino meal, it's definitely something that, that people just like, oh, hey, you know, meat's expensive. So, so in order to fill up more, they use, they, they make it saucy. They pour that over the rice and instantly you have something that's that will sustain you with flavor. So, yeah, I, I think that that we try to attack all the flavor, all the flavors. And that, again, those the condiments that you speak of, bagoong, suka, you know, vinegar, fermented shrimp paste, fish sauces, soy sauces, you know, a mixture of any of those ingredients. That is, is that kind of place to, to personalize the dish itself for, for you. Okay. you know? I understand the whole balance. And I understand as well, like using the different, you know, basic tastes to create something complex. But, you know, if you take like, um, you know, French cuisine or I mean, you went, you said you went to France, you went to Spain, yeah, you know, yeah. and the spectrum for me of of this brightness and pungency and, you know, acidity is really emphasized in the Filipino cuisine in a way that I mean, some of this could be from someone who is not really used to it, like really funky. You know, so <laughs> that's what I thought was, I found me in like interesting in, uh, in that cuisine. Yeah. And, and again, reliving my, my, my European experience, like, you know, in Germany involving, uh, gravies and mustards. Yeah. This is obviously I'm generalizing. There's a little bit more nuance to this, but, you know, but serving, serving sausages with mustards or in Spain, you know, having, you know, creating a salsa verde, whether it's, uh, uh, in Argentina, you know, creating chimichurri or or cri or criosha, whatever it is, you'll see that that in every country, in most countries, that there is a certain level of kind of wiggle room for you to adjust the flavor profile, whether it's through through these condiments or or through you know through the addition of something. But in France, France is probably one of the only places that I've experienced that doesn't have as many as large of a level of personalization in, in the cuisine and i and i could be mistaken no we we, we have the funkiness in the cheese <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's where, that's where there, we have yeah. it yeah <laughs> there you go <laughs> this is so true i think that it is interesting I, I think that to have a really great overview of of seeing all the different cultures and how they how they adjust flavors and what they put on their table to adjust those flavors is it's pretty defining you know okay 
So what are for you like the top five Filipino dishes that uh, people in the U.S. should try? Oh, man, that's a that's a loaded question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> a lot of so a lot of people would say, oh, you should do the basics, you know, adobo, pancit, lumpia, all these things. Uh, and, and yeah, sure. People. Yeah, those are those are the well-known dishes. But I was talking about uh, about this with the cook friend of mine that works with me. And we were just like, man, I would want to go all the funky stuff like. We we're talking about there's a dish a stew in the philippines called caldereta and traditionally made with goat and it's like this tomato braise uh it's a braise basically made with with all the fun goat parts you know the tougher muscles but it also incorporates elements of like potatoes olives peppers fish sauce a little bit of funk in there and that to me is like it, that is it's a wild it's a really pronounced in flavor and that a lot of people don't see that Filipino cuisine. They usually go adobo, which is fine, which is great. But man, caldereta is like a really big pop of flavor. And that kind of leads into another dish, kare kare, which is made with oxtails, but it's a peanut butter stew. And this is where you see that condiment game, right? It's, you know, the bagong, the fermented shrimp paste is served alongside of that because the dish itself is so heavy in using peanut butter, there's this like s almost bland sweetness. This It sounds weird, but it's very meaty. You taste the oxtail very rich. You have the peanut butter, which is very rich as well, but the peanut butter mutes down the salt that is incorporated into the dish. So then people use the fermented shrimp paste to then now season the dish with every bite. And I think that that is a good understanding of the way that Filipinos traditionally eat. I think people should try sinigang. It's a sour soup. I love it. It's made yeah, with... Yeah, I've um, tried that. Oh, it's, I it's like super tart, really refreshing on the palate. You can make it with any ingredient you want. Seafood, meat, whatever. And it uses... And the the sour, I'm sure the sour ingredient as well could vary. I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm, absolutely. Know, as well from, from one part of the, of the Philippines like to another, correct? Because yeah, I've, absolutely. Because I've seen it with like tamarind. I've seen it with uh -huh. guava. Yeah. You know, I've seen it with... Passion fruit. You know, with uh, passion, passion fruit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, mangosteen or, you know, kind of that type. Yeah. Yeah. You and know, it, pineapple. Exactly. Exactly. That's the wonder of, of what Sinigang is. It, you know, a lot of these dishes, their names belie their... They think that that's the name of the actual dish. It's actually just a cooking technique. You know, it, it, that's all it is. The traditional stuff, yeah, using tamarind or guava or passion fruit, all these things. Basically, it's just taking, taking any green fruit Good friends of mine in the South and in, in California over at Lhasa, uh, Chad, he used rhubarb. And it, I was like, it, it didn't skip a beat. It's still sour. It's still slightly fruity. And then he incorporated that with, uh, you know, with whatever, whatever protein he did. And it was authentic to him, you know? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. sin, yeah. So, so it's pretty amazing to see that. So yeah, sinigang, kare kare, you have caldereta. I think that if you really want to get into the funky stuff, one of my personal favorites is called pinapaitan. So it's actually a bitter soup. And this may sound funky to a lot of people, but when we slaughter a goat in the Philippines, when I, whenever I would go visit my grandmother, nothing is wasted. So everything is used, right? All the intestines, all the offal meats, all everything. So this particular soup is made with, uh, with the bile duct of the goat. So the bile is used to bitter to add a little bitter note. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And a lot of people are, are like, oh, bile. It's like, actually, it, you know, it's the same thing as rennet. You know, when making cheese, you use rennet to, to you know, it's basically stomach acid to curdle the, the cheese. Yeah. So it's the same principle. It's just adding a, a, another layer of flavor profile. And what is the, uh, the one with the, the pork blood? Stew. Oh, What's dinuguan. 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 Yeah. Oh, my because God. That's that... another funky one, this one. Oh, and, <laughs> but it's another amazing thing. I mean. Uh, again, if anybody who's traveled extensively will see, you know, like when I was in Germany, we made bloodwurst, right? In France, you have the same, you have blood sausages, right? You have, um, Absolutely. Yep. yeah, all these ingredients that are used that a lot of people are like, oh my God, that's weird. Oftentimes when you, when you hear the phrase of, ooh, what is that? Well, it's usually in, in the US because anywhere you go, any, any country that you go to that's, that's worth their grain and salt. As far as like utilizing a whole animal, they utilize everything. 
and and yeah, Dinagon would be be another one that that I would want people to taste. My personal favorite pairing with that is uh, a steamed rice cake called puto, which is a swear word, obviously in Spanish, but like in the Philippines is a steamed white rice cake. Then you serve it alongside this like irony rich blood stew of pork, and you have this balance because the dinagon has acid, salt, and richness, and the, and then the the steamed rice cake absorbs that and adds that level of sweetness to balance the 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 high minerality of it all, and it just it's like I don't know heaven in every bite. I'm just salivating talking about these dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you serve it the uh, dinuguan at uh, at your restaurant? We did, in, yeah. In well, so when we were when we were open for you know pre COVID, obviously, uh, we actually had it on the menu, and it was actually a very popular dish. Yep. Obviously, we changed some of the presentation. We we kind of added our our modern twist to it you know having cooked for 20 plus years in varying in varying kitchens we just added our own little our own little modernization of it but never never ever veering far away from the traditional flavors of what you know what dinuguan in its essence is so can you talk to us a little bit about your uh, your restaurant in in portland yeah, what's, absolutely. Uh, you know what's the what's the concept? Obviously, it's Filipino cuisine. I get that, but I'm guessing it's the modern spin and modern view on, yeah. on Filipino cuisine. Whenever people ask me to describe the restaurants, I describe it as a non-traditional Filipino restaurant that is inspired by its roots, by the tradition, by traditional and authentic flavors that are authentic to me. So it is a modern Filipino restaurant serving modern versions of traditional dishes that you would find like the dinuguan it's a great example you know we take our own take on that you know traditional dinuguan is basically chop all the meat together cook it cook it kind of like an adobo style soy sauce vinegar you know garlic bay leaves and you add the blood to thicken it and call it a day we just take those same components and we just modernize it a bit we slowly slowly cook a pork collar and slice it nicely and we sear it off to add a little crunch and then that sauce the blood sauce that, I, that that we make is essentially the same thing, minus the meat. We take a beautifully rich pork stock. We hit it with a little bit of vinegar and soy and bay leaf, and you know, kind of incorporating layers of flavor. And at the very end, we use the blood to thicken it up, just like in traditional French cooking. You know, you use the blood or egg yolks to thicken up a sauce. We do the same thing with our blood, and make sure it's nice and clean. And we, we nappe that over the, you know, we, we, we drape it over this beautifully seared pork collar. And, but we still serve it alongside a steamed rice cake that we make in house, you know? And again, taking these, these traditional dishes and just giving it a little, uh, a little cosmetic beauty upgrade, you know? <laughs> So I'm curious, you know, when, uh, with every, uh, with every chef that I, you know, took to that I have on the show here. I asked them about, um, you know, the source of inspiration and, and the creative process. So I would like to do this with you. But what I'm interested in, in is trying to understand the source of inspiration. It's obviously linked to the Philippines, but I, I'm, I'm curious to see if you are looking at different, you know, regional specialties than, you know, from around the Philippines that you can bring into, um, you know, your menu and then when it comes to the creative approach, how far can we go? Can you go staying away from being completely traditional, but still having the the roots of the you know the Filipino cuisine? So, can you explain to us a little bit, you know, your your process? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really different from you know. Obviously, there's some roots that are important here because it it is a Filipino you know restaurant. So, so I'm yeah. I'm just curious, how do you do you uh, handle that? You know, to understand the creative process a little bit, we, you know, just go a quick little overview. I've been cooking for 20 plus years. I think now it's about 21, 22 at this point. I'm 39 now. I lived in the Philippines. I, I actually grew up in Detroit originally, Michigan. And then I moved to the Philippines when I was 11. So I spent 10 years there. So I had a very interesting upbringing where I really immersed into the Filipino culture later on. Not, not necessarily in the beginning of my life. I mean, yes, it was around due to my parents and, and family, but really experiencing the Philippines for what it is. I mean, I went to high school and college in a place. So that really makes an impact on anybody. And it also impacted the way that I ate and the way that I explored food. 
in those 20 plus years, I mean, I've trained under so many different, sh- t- you know, chefs at so many different cuisines, whether it was new American, French, you know, classic French, German, you know, Italian, Spanish, and I've cooked all these different cuisines. And the advantage with that was that I've seen so many similarities and giving names to techniques that I already knew cooking Filipino food or just like even kind of upgrading those techniques like, oh, I could, you know, sear something on high heat to give it a nice Maillard reaction, you know, or, or, or doing all these whatever geeky cooking terminology you want to get into. But at the end of the day, what that did was it really helped me find my own path in Filipino food. What I consider the food here at Magnus is a modern, a modern approach, again, to traditional cuisine. So the, the main source of inspiration is the regionality in the Philippines. I grew up Ilocano, so a lot of the dishes that I eat are, are stemming from you know, the ancestral home of my father and my mom. Even though they're both Ilocano, they actually came from two different parts uh, of an island, one from the most northern tip, which was seafood heavy, and one that was a little bit more inland, which then you see a lot more dried fish and a little bit more meat. So I draw inspiration from understanding those particular flavor profiles and then taking the, you know, the 20, 21, 22 years of experience cooking and applying kind of this, a different eye to what a dish can be. I've made dishes that would hit very close to, to a traditional dish, you know, um, but I've also gone very far out of left field and looking nothing like Filipino food. But when you explain it to somebody who's fil- familiar with Filipino food or when they taste it, they're like, oh my God, that kind of tastes like sinigang or that kind of tasted, that tastes like adobo. And it could be something completely different. A great example, I was playing with a lobster the other day and I created a lobster sinigang, but it wasn't in a brothy soup. I added a little bit of gelatin to this rich lobster, sour lobster broth that I made using tomatoes and green mango and it was actually a chilled dish so it was it was you know a sinigang jelly that was in, you know inside this lobster tail with the you know vegetables and the lobster but when you take a bite it had those same elements of sour so we can take it anywhere and that's kind of what i'm excited about with filipino food right now is that that we can explore it it's not going to please everybody i i piss off a lot more people than i <laughs> than i make happy i would say <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've been, you know, I started cooking Filipino food and selling it, like really bringing it, to trying to push for the mainstream back in 2000 and when was that? 2011. I started doing pop-ups and that's, you know, it it's, may seem like a short time, but nine years ago, there wasn't a lot of Filipino food on the market. You know, you, st- um, you started to do pop-up in Chicago, correct? With, yeah, um, you know, your, your friends and so on. And then after yeah. that, you knew you did it in, in Portland when you were in Clyde Common. So, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, in, in 2009, when I was still living in Chicago, my dad had passed away. And it was in, in the final conversation with him that really kind of made me realize that I have a place in this world. And kind of making this, this promise to him, you know, really drove me to pursue Filipino food. Because the years leading up, my, all, the, all the years that I had already been cooking, my dad was always like, why don't you do Filipino food? Why don't you incorporate this, that, or the other? I was, like, I was like, dad, nobody wants to cook that. Everybody wants French food, Spanish food, all this stuff, you know? But then you come full circle, and sure, it, t- it took a tragic moment in my life to, to realize it, but it really pushed me to go that route. And it's been a, an amazing journey. Like, genuinely, it's, it's been so much fun experimenting and failing at so many dishes, but you know, when you succeed, when you have a success in a dish, you're like, man, that was, that was awesome. And so and I'm sure your dad is uh, very proud of you. No. I, I would, you know, I, I, I would, I would like to hope so. I'm, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the name Magna itself is stems from part of my last name. It's kind of my, my little homage to my, to my family, to, to my bloodline, you know, one can only hope that we can leave behind a, a legacy and, I'm not famous. I'm not cool. I'm not, you know, hip with it, if you will. But my legacy that I leave will be to the, to my, my kids, to, to the people that I work with. I always joke around and I tell people, you know, when I die, I would want people to come and say, to share a story that was, that was meaningful or impactful and, and see how many people show up. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have time. You just said you're 39. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? 
The world, the world is weird, <laughs> yeah. man. But, I know, I know. That's true. How is it going at the at the moment? So you said, uh, so the restaurant is closed, correct? When, when COVID hit, um, it, was yeah. very, it was a very trying time, obviously. But um, we've managed to run with it. Just like the typical Filipino attitude, I like to call. We like to adapt. So, you know, we, we keep fighting for, for what we believe in. And, and what we believe in is bringing Filipino food to the masses. So we've continued on doing takeouts, adapting the dishes, uh, you know, kind of not going the super modern approach, but kind of really getting back in touch with the roots of what the cuisine is, which is great. Still putting our, our twists on it, but we've had a strong takeout business so far. Um, we've also had managed to have some um, great outdoor seating for as long as the weather was holding up. Now it's kind of getting a little chilly, so we're, we're a little scared to see what happens, but um, we're still here. We're, we're definitely pushing and we're managing to adapt and, you know, pushing to overcome any obstacles that come in our way, um, whether that means branching out into another, you know, maybe another endeavor or just experimenting with what dishes might work or, you know, just trying to stay relevant in, in a very uh, tumultuous world. Hopefully, yeah. um, you know, when it's going to be whatever the new norm is that uh, I can travel again and definitely come to uh, Magna and, and, and taste the food. That would be my honor to feed you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can you share with us like a Filipino dish that someone like me, like, like a food enthusiast, you know, could make at home, but it will have your spin on it? Oh, absolutely. I think about what dishes people can make very quickly, but I realize that Filipino cooking isn't fast. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of, you know, stir and wait. I think a lot of people should really, truly explore what adobo is, you know, as, as a personal dish, a lot of people will be familiar with it, yet surprised that you can make it, you know? Um, so what do you put in your adobo? How do so you make it? Me, me personally, I, when, when I cook adobo at home, I make it with pork belly. I use por a, a combination of both pork belly and pork neck bone. There's good meat on the neck bone, and it adds a lot of great flavor to the broth when it's brought down. And uh, the pork belly itself, obviously, being a tougher cut and rich, too, because of the fat, will add a lot of that you kind of, again, that richness to the dish. But I cook it the way that my dad cooks it. So water, vinegar, bay leaf, garlic, peppercorns inside the pot with your neck bones and pork belly just to cover pork belly can be diced up and you start slowly cooking that down now the difference between most adobos a lot of people do which is very saucy i like mine a little on the drier side so it's a little bit more on the oily side because that oil that fat is is such great flavor when you put it on rice so i actually cook it so, so the liquid is almost all gone and then i season it with the soy sauce so I don't add the soy sauce in the beginning because if you add the soy sauce in the beginning, as it cooks out, it actually become the, the bitter notes of the soy sauce will, will come out more and you don't want that. So I always season it at the very end and I never eat it right away. I always eat it the day after, you know, it, it's, no. it sucks. It's, it's a labor of patience <laughs> because again, just like any braise, it'll be so much better the next day because all those flavors are allowed to sit in there and, and re-soak back into the meats. Yes, you can eat it right away. It's fine, but like mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. going to be significantly better the next day. That's one thing that that I would I, I would encourage okay. people to try out. And you serve and, it uh, so with, with rice or? Oh yeah, just serve it with a nice yeah. bowl of white rice. Using um, jasmine rice is is the most common uh, rice in the Philippines. Long grain, uh, milagrosa is the is the varietal. Even though they they use so many different kinds of rice, short grain, long grain, sticky rice, you know all that stuff, but commonly eaten with a meal is definitely the longer grains so thank you chef so um are you um, ready to answer my rapid fire question now i'm oh, thinking man, about I've, you know whew, let's let's time. do this i'm gonna i'm gonna <laughs> let's see if if my answers will piss people off let's do it well uh, no no it's all good <laughs> questions so, so Let's say that I can travel to Portland and you and I are going into a tasting tour in Portland. So what are like the five spots that you will take me to? I would take you to Masia. Jose Chess is one of the most talented chefs I know. Uh, Javier for the, for the beautiful noodles that they do. It's a Vietnamese restaurant. I would go to Rilam Inn for fried chicken for sure. I would actually go to uh, Lovely's 50-50 for some really, really great pizza with a Portland flair. 
and then I would take you to Pips Donuts just because you know you got to end with a little sweet and uh, <laughs> okay, and have a cool. good, yeah have a good cup of chai chai tea and some donuts at Pips yeah that's that's a really? five places in that order too wow. no, <laughs> that was fast you know it wow oh, very I, good I, I've got this on lock yeah <laughs> this is what's due your diligence <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite guilty pleasure food ooh guilty pleasure food my favorite. Oh, that's a loaded question, isn't it? My really genuinely favorite guilty pleasure food and a lot of people. I love a good Big Mac. It sounds so oh. bad, but like No, good, no, wait. Yeah, good sure. Big Mac from McDonald's? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what what's like the three cookbooks that inspired you the most in your career? Oh man, uh easy. Uh Magastronomy by Fernand Pont. I think it's one of the, the best cookbooks out there because it's not full of recipes. It's full of guidelines the french laundry was uh, one of the greatest cookbooks out there yeah a classic because again yeah the introduction to modern cuisine and the last one actually isn't a cookbook but it's a compilation of essays by uh, a woman named doreen fernandez who is a, a filipino food journalist and it's a compilation of her essays called Tikim. and those that those essays were very influential in revisiting filipino food What's your biggest pet peeves in the kitchen? Oh, biggest pet peeves? Like disorganization and uncleanliness. Your station should be clean. Your <laughs> and, and, cons oh yeah, and consolidating. That's actually, actually the biggest pet peeve is consolidation. If you see something in a giant container, put it in a smaller container or appropriately sized container, consolidate okay. it down, you know? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I yeah. hate that. Hate it. Okay. <laughs> And uh, so if you could, tell, you could teleport yourself in any restaurant in the world for dinner tonight, where would you go? I would go to Extabari in Spain, hands down. That would where, be... Where is, it, where is it located, this one? Uh, it's where is it Spain. located in Spain? In Spain? It's in, um, it's, I believe, right outside of uh, San Sebastian. I ah, ro okay. ro I, forgot, uh, I forgot the name of the town, but it's a small town outside of San Sebastian, Extabari. It's like the... Where this guy only cooks on charcoal, no gas in his kitchen at all. Ah, yeah. He yeah. created the, the, oh my God. Yeah. I would go there. <laughs> okay. So the last question. So if I come to your house now and I will open the fridge or the cupboard and what are like, beside like the classics, what are like, what condiment spice sauces do you have at hand? Oh, um, I have at least seven hand. different hot sauces. Uh, varying from degrees of heat and flavor, because um, I kind of collect hot sauces, which is weird, but I love it. Um, I, have see... I do, I do too as well. I have a whole uh, drawer. I have a whole drawer of uh, of them and oh, in the fridge too. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine brought me this weird one made with durian. Do you know what durian is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. I do I know durian? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, he uh, he wow. brought me a hot sauce made. It was it's funky, but um, you'll find hot sauces. You're going to find a lot of Indian pickles because my, my wife is half Indian. A lot of fermented things like kimchi and whatnot because I love funk. And string cheese and yogurt because my kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was outside the condiment. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> you're going to find them. <laughs> they, turn yes, into a, they turn into a condiment when you're really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> very cool thank you very much Seth uh, to be uh, to be on the show I, I'm, I'm really glad that we, we had um, you know an opportunity to talk and celebrate uh, Filipino cuisine with you oh thank you so much it was definitely a pleasure to reconnect with you man I, I hope that you can make it out um, and I hope you're staying safe and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to share a meal soon yeah thank you very much I, I hope we we can uh, I'm sure it's going to be in 2021 but <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> but uh, you know ho hopefully I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Chef Carlo La Magna and that you have learned a little bit more about Filipino cuisine. If you like today's episode, please share it with another chef or with one of your friends. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Flavors Unknown Podcast, and you can find the show note from this episode and all the previous episodes on the website flavorsunknown.com. I want to give again this week a shout out to a great forum and educational resource for chefs called The Learning Chef. It is created by chefs and for chefs 
they have a great Facebook page and Facebook group called The Learning Chef. So please check it out. In two weeks, my guest will be Chef Bry Schumann from Brooklyn, New York. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.